Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about whether there's an autoimmune component or connection to ADHD. I'll be talking for about 20 minutes, and if you have questions, feel free to type them in as I'm talking. This will be posted on YouTube as well as on Facebook later. And I will start with the takeaway message. The takeaway message is that autoimmune conditions are associated both with kids who have ADHD and with mothers of kids who will go on to develop ADHD. So higher rates of autoimmune um, conditions, problems in both groups, mothers and kids who develop it. We have plausible mechanisms by which autoimmune processes could lead to ADHD. Um, but so far, most of the studies are correlational and no clear causative evidence is present yet that this is a substantial, substantial contributor to leading to individuals developing ADHD. That doesn't mean it isn't, it's just that the evidence so far is scanty and weak. So to back up a little bit, what are autoimmune diseases? So usually our immune system is there to protect us from foreign invasion, whether that's pathogens, so disease-causing life forms or quasi-life forms, bacteria, parasites, fungus, viruses, which those may be on the border of life, depending on your definition, and also environmental toxins that are coming in through breathing in smoke or other, or ingesting with our food. Usually our immune system does a pretty good job of recognizing what's self and not attacking our own tissues, our own cells, our own body, and reserving its attack forces for foreign invaders. But there are certain situations where that doesn't hold true. And also there's a number of states of hyperactive immune system where even though it may have made the right identification, most of the symptoms someone's suffering from, most of the problems are a byproduct of overactive immune system activation. So it winds up harming or attacking our own bodies. So, so sort of the two big mechanisms, and this is my weird division, but I'll, I'll do it. And so one is molecular mimicry. So sometimes a foreign chemical entity looks enough like a normal chemical that's in our body. So the immune system is confused and may start up by reacting to a certain chemical finds in smoke or a certain protein on a virus's cell, and that attack item is close enough to something that is in our body that the body, that the immune system is confused and directs a specific attack. So we, we there are rare, um, both psychotic disorders and rare OCD disorders where we have pretty good evidence that the overactive immune targeting specific proteins is attacking parts of the brain and causing a clear-cut, robust, full-fledged psychiatric syndrome. Again, we, we do not have evidence for that in ADHD. The other sort of mechanism is a more general overwhelm, that if our bodies are overwhelmed by too many battles that they have to fight, if our immune system's facing such a huge onslaught, either from viruses or other pathogens or environmental toxins or general stress, then it's more prone to making mistakes or sort of being overactivated and blanketing our own, damaging our own bodies in its attempt to defend ourselves. And although this is not a strong part of mainstream medicine, a large part of current naturopathic process postulates that because of our current Western diets where we have way more gluten, which is a protein in primarily wheat, but also barley, a few other grains, um, because we have an exposure to vastly more of it, and not just in our foods, but into things like our shampoos and our, so our skin, other parts of our body are exposed. And maybe because we're exposed to, um, we're not just consuming more foods with flour, but the flour itself has been enriched to have more gluten in it and maybe possibly GMO modification of some of these wheat plants have caused slightly different variants of gluten and gliadin molecules. So the claim is 
that, that our bodies are exposed to this onslaught of gluten, that our body's immune system is reacting to that, and part of the reacting um, is an outpouring of antibodies and other cytokines, cytokines, which are chemicals produced by the immune system that causes damage to the lining of the digestive system and causes a weakening of the digestive system um, barrier from the content of the digestive system into the blood. So this leaky gut then causes more exposure of different proteins, different pathogens that normally the body wouldn't even see. So the body becomes more overwhelmed and again results in a range of what the naturopaths are saying is a broad range of autoimmune diseases. Many of these don't reach the criteria for Western med medicines um, diagnosing a full-blown disease state. Um, so what's the evidence linking ADHD in hyperimmune or autoimmune status? So one is just for years, you know, starting with um, doctors at ADHD clinics noting disproportionate numbers of kids coming into these clinics had autoimmune problems, including asthma, including hay fever, just allergic rhinitis is a fancy term, including type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes we know is an immune reaction to certain cells in the pancreas. It's not the more common type 2 diabetes, which certainly involves for most people, probably autoimmune elements, but also lifetime greater exposure to sugars in the diet. Um, psoriasis is another autoimmune condition that's more prevalent in kids with ADHD. So again, there have been a number of studies trying to control for environmental or other causes, but pretty clearly there's, there are increases in these autoimmune conditions in kids who have ADHD relative to kids in the same areas, same theoretical environmental exposure. Um, so, so that suggests that at least in some kids with ADHD, there's a hyperimmune condition going on. So re <clears throat> related to that, there have been a number of studies and recently the whole population of Sweden was scanned and in mothers and similarly in Australia, they did a fairly comprehensive nationwide study in countries that have better or more comprehensive national healthcare systems and more comprehensive databases for studying things. So in these situations, mothers who have clear cut autoimmune conditions, including type one diabetes, including multiple sclerosis, including asthma, including rheumatoid arthritis, um, have kids that are more likely to develop ADHD. And it's, again, it's a substantial, it's measurable. It's on the order of, you know, 20% higher rates to one and a half times, one almost twice the rate of um, ADHD compared to the general population whose mothers are not exposed to auto, or dealing with autoimmune conditions. Third line of evidence, and this is even scantier, is that some studies, but not all, have found elevations of cytokines, which again are specific immune system chemicals that circulate to the body to generally activate different parts of the immune system. So some studies have found elevations of certain parts of the, um, so certain markers of immune system activation are found in ADHD. Not all the studies are consistent. Um, some of them have found interleukin-6, which is a commonly measured cytokine. Another study found elevated antibodies to certain Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, which have been implicated cerebellar damage in some aspects of ADHD. So again, there have certainly been other studies that did not find perturbations of immune chemical profiles in people with ADHD. So this, this data is weaker, but some of it's tantalizing. So fourth general linkage is that there are certain gene variants um, that can slightly increase your risk to having hyperimmune, hyperactivated immune, immune status. And, and as we've talked before in these, um, presentations, 
ADHD has a strong genetic component to it, but it's not as simple as you have one or two genes and it leads to a bad version of a dopamine receptor or something like that. All the evidence we have right now is that hundreds, if not a few thousand gene variants each increase the risk a tiny bit genetically for developing ADHD. And there does seem to be some overlap between some of these hundreds of genes which slightly increase the risk for immune problems and some of them that's that slightly increase the risk for ADHD. So there may be common genetic contributors to increased vulnerability. Um, the fifth line of evidence is that factors that lead to hyperactive inflammatory status early in life, so particularly certain infections, possibly prematurity itself. Um, so certain early life exposures are correlated again with kids having higher rates of ADHD than with kids who don't have such early life perturbations or pro-inflammatory triggers. And then the sixth line of evidence is animal studies. So here we can actually take a mouse or a rat and inject them with certain chemicals, which we know will hyperactivate their immune system. And what we see is the pups, the babies, have a host of behavioral sequelae that look a lot like ADHD. So increased hyperactivity, but not just hyperactivity, there's ways to measure impulsivity in baby rodents. So more hyperactive, more impulsive baby rats and mice, decreases in attention and decreases in memory. So again, it's always hard to equate an animal model, but, but on a number of different behavioral variables, these animal models look like potentially a model for ADHD, or these symptoms look like a model for ADHD. And again, our direct result, here we know it's a direct result of hyperactivating the immune system. So that's sort of the available evidence we have. How could or what's the mechanism by which hyperactive immune system, I mean, the immune system again is there to fight off infection, fight off, can remove bad chemicals from the body. How does that translate into changes in the brain structure and neurochemistry? So one is the, the glial cells in the brain, so the non-neurons in the brain, and some of them actually are immune system or cells. So glial activation um, could change brain processes, could change how the adjacent nerves, neurons are acting, responding, and including, so hyperactivation of nervous system can actually result in nerve cell death. So certainly if you're particularly early in life when the brain is changing, growing, laying down the foundation for future pathways, connections, um, functions, damage particularly early on in life could alter how the brain develops. Um, a third factor is that hyperactivation, hyperimmune states in the brain can cause breakages or leakage in the blood-brain barrier. So again, usually the brain is a particularly immune privileged site. Um, so not just, so certain proteins, certain, everything in the blood doesn't just directly go into the blood in your brain. There are filters to protect the brain from foreign chemicals and pathogens. Um, and again, hyperimmune states can weaken or disrupt this blood-brain barrier. Um, measurably, and again, in some of those animals where the mother's injected with, hyper, with chemicals to induce a hyperactive immune state, we can see changes in neurotransmission. So the metabolism of how serotonin, neuro, norepinephrine, dopamine are produced can be altered by these um, exposures to the mother. And certainly, again, in the animal models, you can wind up with differently wired networks, particularly with dopamine, serotonin, and glutamate systems, all of which have been implicated in ADHD. Those networks, those collections of cells are structurally and functionally different in baby rats or mice whose mothers have been exposed during pregnancy to hyperimmune states. Um, so again, we have lots of association, lots of 
anecdotal evidence clearly this is not a necessary mechanism so clearly a large percentage of people with a d h d have not had either in their mother or in themselves any hyper immune status so again we're not saying this is the source of the pathway for everyone the question is whether it is contributory for a substantial number of people again many of these lines of evidence are correlations rather than cause the, the, the best causative evidence we have is in animal models which it's hard to know how well those translate to the real picture um, and some sort of lines of evidence that this may not be that crucial and important to roll for a majority of people with ADHD. One is that autoimmune problems themselves strongly by women outnumber men. Um, different studies, different diseases suggest two, three, four times as common among women as in men, which is in contrast to the ADD picture where historically boys substantially outnumbered girls in terms of the diagnosis now that we're more aware particularly looking for inattentive forms of adhd and knowing that it does occur in women young girls we're also picking up more cases of it but at the very most um, some studies have found one-to-one -one parity most still find higher rates in men than women so again that doesn't fit with autoimmunity in general is much more prevalent among women and if autoimmunity was the major contributor to adhd we would be expecting a similar sex skewage. Um, so even if this is a factor, or maybe a factor for an individual, what can we do about it or what can be changed? Again, this is drawing more from the naturopaths than the sort of allopathic, laboratory-driven um, modern medicine, Western medicine. Um, but if you have concerns, particularly if you have other autoimmune conditions, it may be worth trying a dietary restriction to see what effect removing gluten from your diet for a month or two does in terms of either your other autoimmune problem or your ADD itself. Um, there are certainly case histories where people reporting improvement of ADHD symptoms by removing um, gluten from their diet. There's certainly other, I mean, gluten, although it's at the top for the naturopaths, there could be other chemicals, particularly food dyes and additives. There have been suggestions there that those can contribute to ADHD. So a dietary, whether it's direct toxicity or again, an autoimmune process, it's not clear. Um, that's another case where a dietary restriction, at least theoretically, may alleviate ADHD symptoms. And Again, hyper in, uh, so other sort of general recommendations would be finding ways to reduce our exposure to environmental toxins, to that's essentially cleaning up the environment, using fewer plastics in your, storing your food, serving your food, preparing your food. Um, what else? doing things to maintain the rest of your body's health because a healthy body supports a healthy immune system. So getting particularly adequate and well-timed sleep, exercise, eating a healthy diet and avoiding things that might cause problems and meditation and other approaches that may reduce stress. So I'm not seeing any questions so far. Next week's talk, and I'll double check when I, so next week's talk is gonna be about brain networks and what we're learning from our increasing understanding of subsystems of the brain and how they interact and what that may teach us or inform us about ADHD. So stay healthy, stay happy, have a good week, and I will be back next week.